Island Crimes and Mysteries with Newells. Hey guys and welcome to another episode of Ireland Crimes and Mysteries. I want to thank you for joining me today and if you're a returning listener I want to say a big thank you for your continued support. If this is your first time listening to my podcast, welcome. It's great to have you on board. Island Crimes and Mysteries. Now guys, before we begin today's episode, I'd like you to take a listen to a little promo from my friends over at Haunted UK Podcast. If, like me, you're into ghost stories, UFOs and all sorts of mysteries, then you will love this podcast. I picked up the phone and said hello. At first there was just a crackling, static noise. Then a voice, which sounded like part of the static, said, I'm not leaving. Then the line went dead. Chills went all over me, but I was determined to find out if this had a rational explanation. I went back to the other office and waited outside for Darren to arrive with the keys. A few minutes later, we were unlocking the door and inside, only to find out that the phone wasn't even plugged into the wall. This is the Haunted UK Podcast, and I'm the show's host, Steve. And that was an extract from Working with the Unknown. A terrifying tale about a listener's experience in her nighttime workplace. One of the many true cases we regale and present to you on the show. So, if you enjoy a creepy tale or two, stories of real life ghost encounters, doppelgangers, time slips, lesser known UK hauntings, then join us every Friday for an episode where we frequently cross the threshold of the unknown. So head over to Haunted Podcast UK and give them a follow. You won't be disappointed. Now back to today's episode. Today's case takes us to Raymore, a small townsland in North Kerry, not far from Tralee, which in November 1958 was the scene of a murder that would become a sensation across the country and would eventually inspire John B. Keane to write one of his most famous plays in 1965. This would then be made into a well-known, critically acclaimed 1990 film called The Field, which starred Richard Harris as the Bull McCabe and John Hurt as Bird O'Donnell. The murder was such a big event at the time, people coming from all over the country to see where a man named Morris Moss Moore had been brutally murdered on a piece of remote windswept bogland on his way home from a card game at a neighbour's house on a cold November night in 1958. It caused such a sensation at the time as murder in Ireland was a rare occurrence, with an average of one to two murders a year being the norm. Moss had been out that night at a neighbour's house, a lady named Julia Collins, playing a game of cards, a popular pastime in rural Ireland back in the 1950s. In remote parts of rural Ireland, your neighbour was your best friend and someone to rely on, especially if you lived alone. Locals would congregate at each other's houses to play card games and chat over a cup of tea or a bottle of stout to pass the night away and help alleviate the isolation that came with living in such lonely parts of the countryside. It was a time before television, and cars were a rare sight, so people would walk in the blackness of the night to their neighbours for a few hours of frivolity and company. They knew these dark by-roads and fields like the back of their hands, so for Moss to walk home alone that night, with nothing but a bicycle lamp for light in the November darkness, was nothing unusual. Of course, on this particular night, Moss never made it home and a search got underway to find him once it was noticed that he was indeed missing. It would take eight days to eventually find Moss's body, hidden in a drain in a stream. Immediately, suspicion fell on one person, a man named Dan Foley. Moss and Dan had known each other all their lives and were great friends as well as neighbours. But they would fall out on an epic scale over a dispute about land. Owning your own plot of land in Ireland in those days was considered a great source of pride and gave you a standing in the community. Maybe it was because of the fallout of years of Irish farms and lands being subject to the landlord system 
where the Irish were basically tenants on their own land, subject to the whims and rules of a foreign landowner. Landlords accounted for 97% of the land ownership in Ireland in the 1870s and rented small plots, sometimes as small as one acre, to tenant farmers who had to pay rent to the landlord and taxes to the Church of Ireland and the state, as well as keep their families fed and warm. All too often these tenants could not afford the rent, which led to evictions and other such punishments. These punishments were meted out for such things as a tenant marrying without permission. Even showing ordinary hospitality was forbidden in an attempt to prevent vagrancy. Fines would be imposed for offences such as trespass, damage to woods and lack of punctuality in the payment of rents. A crowd gathered around a burning cottage was not an uncommon sight in these times as landlords doled out these punishments. So that made owning your own plot a real source of pride and accomplishment and understandably, It made the landowner extremely protective of every inch they owned. After all, in 1958 in Ireland, it was this generation's grandparents and parents who most likely had suffered at the hands of the landlords. That feeling of pride in the land was summed up beautifully by the character Gerald O'Hara when he said to his daughter Scarlett in the 1939 film Gone with the Wind, To anyone with a drop of Irish blood in them, why... The land they live on is like their mother. So arguments over land became commonplace in Ireland, be it with neighbours or within families, and to a certain extent continues today. So for Moss and Dan to have this fallout was nothing unusual. Their dispute was meant to be heard at the Tralee Circuit Court with a date set for a month after Moss was murdered. And rumour has it that Dan had said to somebody... Only one of them would be turning up at the court for the court date. But Dan denied killing Moss and the community was divided, some believing him while others were convinced he was the guilty party. Dan and Moss were great friends and cut turf and saved hay together for years. Their land just separated by a sod ditch, which they removed after agreeing that they would eventually put up a fence. Everything was fine until Dan decided he wanted to put up that fence to prevent his cattle from walking towards the bog. The fence went up without consulting Moss, but Moss disputed where Dan had lain it, saying it was encroaching on his own land, a fact Dan Foley disputed. And so the two former friends became embroiled in a battle for ownership for this small but significant piece of land, a half an acre to be precise leading to Moss taking court action against Dan for trespass, before suddenly being murdered. Moss had decided this was the best course of action, as he didn't want any further confrontation and wanted compensation for what he believed was Dan Foley taking a half an acre of his land. As Moss walked home that night from the card game, with money in his pocket and the bicycle lamp in his hand, he was set upon. The money he had in his pocket never found. Dan later telling people that this fact made him certain that Moss was set upon and robbed and whoever had done it had to kill him as he would have recognised them. But the locals didn't buy it, instead believing Dan had killed Moss to avoid going to court and having to give up this piece of land and a lot of them turned against Dan, ostracising him from the community. Moss was reported missing the following morning after it was realised that he had never made it home and search teams were set up immediately amongst the locals and the hunt to find Moss began in earnest. Even at this early stage before what had actually happened to Moss had been established suspicion had fallen at Dan Foley's door by the locals. They turned against him with haste and people stopped talking to him and local shops even refused to serve him or sell his produce. He became persona non grata in his own community almost immediately. The search for Moss continued for eight days before his remains were found at the stream, which coincidentally was the same stream Dan Foley got his water from. A fact that his nephew John Foley speaks to his innocence. I don't think I'd want to drink water from a stream if I thought there was a body in it, he said. Then the bicycle lamp that Moss had with him was eventually found in Dan Foley's turnip garden, 
This reinforced to locals their suspicions that Dan was the culprit. But why, when you have countless bogs and ditches to choose from, would you hide such an item of evidence in your own garden? John feels that the people who actually killed Moss promoted the boycott of his uncle to take any suspicion away from themselves and that the lamp was planted. Was Dan Foley being set up? This field, like in the film, may have led to the death of one man, but definitely was leading to the destruction of another man's life, essentially. Moss Moore was a 46-year-old bachelor farmer when he went missing on November the 6th, 1958, before his body was eventually found on the 15th of November in the stream, covered by rushes to conceal it, some 18 metres from his home in Raymore, Tralee. Chief Superintendent Cronin and Sergeant Costello made the grim discovery at around 3pm that day, after Moss's cap was discovered some 30 metres from the drain while his stick was also found nearby. Moss was still wearing the brown overcoat he was last seen with on the night he disappeared when he left the card game. Unfortunately, the area where his body was located was seriously compromised as lots of people, with good intentions of course, searched for Moss in the intervening days. When he was originally declared missing... The Gardaí should have cordoned off his home and the surrounding area and treated it as a crime scene, especially when his disappearance was suspicious, but this had not been done. As the search for Moss continued, that Saturday Gardaí focused on the stream that flowed down past his house. It was when Sergeant Costello poked something soft with a stick and investigated further, he realised it was a cap. Then a few minutes later and very close to the cap, his decomposing remains were discovered concealed amongst the rushes. It was later surmised that Moss had probably been killed nearby, but knowing for certain, they could never tell, as any evidence like footprints were long gone. But one thing they were certain of was that Moss's death was no accident, as the autopsy would later back up, concluding he had died from strangulation before being dumped. A few strange factors about Moss's murder that would make you question things more was the fact that it had taken a week to find him, despite the fact he was so close to his house. And another occurrence to raise eyebrows was the fact that when neighbours initially reported Moss missing to Gardaí that first day, the locals said he had been murdered. Why jump to such a conclusion straight away? And why did everyone immediately turn on Dan Foley? A sign was put up at the local creamery in Kyle Duff asking people to boycott him before a body had even been found. Was he made a scapegoat by the community to hide the real murderer or murderers? Moss had previously gone to the Gardaí saying he was fearful for his life and felt intimidated by Dan Foley. But the Gardaí advised him that it was a civil case and there wasn't anything they could do about it. He usually would head to Collins's for the card game around 7 after he had finished for the day and headed home around 9.30-10, recently starting to take a shortcut through the fields that led up to his home, the remains of which still stand today. What happened on that shortcut remains a mystery and can only be speculated. The evidence that was recovered did lend credence to a particular course of events, but it is still alleged. The general consensus is that as he neared his own home, Dan Foley stepped out from the darkness to confront Moss. A fight must have broken out between the two of them as Moss had suffered a bloody nose and mouth and his eyes were bruised. This probably knocked the wind out of him and in his weakened state he was then strangled to death. The autopsy showed that his voice box was broken, this fact compounding the idea that it was Dan. It would have taken a strong character to be able to inflict such an injury. And Dan was a big, strong man, like the Bull McCabe in stature. Another fact was that Dan had scratch marks on his face in the days after Moss was reported missing, which he shrugged off as marks he had sustained in a scuffle with a bull. Was he telling the truth? Or is it too much of a coincidence? <laughs> 
It was also widely believed that whoever hid Moss's body had a good knowledge of the area and knew exactly where to put him. The search had been a disaster in terms of preserving evidence as neighbours trod through the field searching ditches and dikes in very inclement weather for eight days. A week into the search, because of the chaotic way it had started out, it was decided after some reassessment to recommence the search starting at Moss's home and working out from there. Of course, the local Gardaí at the time were ill-equipped to cope with everything. This was completely new territory for them. Plus, when they started out, they assumed it was a search and rescue. Never in their wildest dreams did they think they would have a murder investigation on their hands. So it was never treated like a murder investigation. And when it became obvious it was, a lot of potential evidence was lost and there was no longer a crime scene to examine. The house had also been greatly compromised after a wake had been held there for Moss and all the locals had attended. It became a massive story nationally. Reporters and photographers descended on the area in their droves, all trying to catch a glimpse of the potential crime scene area and interview the locals. This was a time before TV was the go-to way of consuming the news. So the papers were full of articles every day about the murder some offering rewards for information, some up to a thousand pounds, a massive amount of money at the time. Radio programmes were full of it too, every show featuring updates and chatting with locals who were horrified by what had happened. At the end of the day, the scenarios as to what actually happened are few. One being that he was robbed for his money and killed. This is the theory that Dan Foley's family feel to be the most likely. His nephew John has stated in the past that he feels that someone was in Moss's house when he returned and because Moss would be able to identify them, they had no choice but to kill him. It was known locally that Moss had sold some cattle in the previous few days and would have had a nice bit of money on him. It was commonplace back then, especially in rural parts of the country, to store cash at home and not use banks. Firstly, as the nearest bank could be miles away in town. And another reason being simply that people didn't trust the banks with their money. So under the floorboards or under the mattress in many cases became the local bank. People would have been aware of this fact, making Moss, a man living on his own in the middle of nowhere, a lucrative target after selling his animals. It was also said that when he left the card game, he had a pound in his pocket. But when his body was discovered, there was no money found in his pockets. Also, when he left to go playing cards, Moss usually locked up his two dogs in the kitchen of his house. A black and white collie named Smalley and a fawn greyhound named Spring. They were running free in the yard when it was discovered that Moss had not made it home from his neighbour's house. As everyone said at the time, they were the only creatures alive, apart from the killer or killers, that held a secret to what had actually happened to Moss. Whoever attacked Moss must have left the dogs out from the kitchen area, some surmised at the time. Another head-scratcher was the fact that Moss's bed was unmade. Moss would always make his bed just before he retired for the night. So the fact that it was unmade also suggests the likelihood was that he had never got to his bed that night. The day prior to his disappearance was a normal day for Moss. He had spent the day in the bog cutting turf before returning around five to tend to his stock. As he returned, he spoke with Paul Reedy, a neighbour, about the upcoming card game that night and they parted ways around 5.20. He arrived at Julia Collins's around 7.30pm after milking his four cows and having his supper. He left the house around 10.15pm with another neighbour, Tim Burgess, and they chatted for about 15 minutes before parting ways. He was witnessed walking up the steep road that led to his farm before disappearing into the night. As I said, he had of late, according to locals, changed his route home and the new route across the fields had its obstacles, such as steep ditches and mud banks. Maybe he sensed that someone was watching him, prompting him to change his route. Dan Foley did say that he heard the dogs barking outside the following morning but had not heard them the previous night. 
He said he wasn't sure if Moss usually left the dogs out on his return as they hadn't been speaking for the last few years. He said he was in bed early that night when Moss disappeared, around 9.30, and that his wife and his brother who lived with him could attest to that fact. Before retiring, he checked the cows and said that on the night Moss disappeared, he could see the outline of a man up at Moss's house. This, of course, would have been when Moss was at the Collins' home playing cards. Dan could not tell from the distance and the darkness who the male figure actually was. It was his other neighbours, Paul Reedy, Michael Reedy and Tim Sugru, who raised the alarm that he was missing when they missed Moss from his usual rounds. Paul Reedy had gone up on the Saturday to check in on Moss and when he entered the farmyard he could hear the cries of the cows coming from the outhouse who had obviously not been milked in quite some time. He also noticed that the front door was not locked and barely latched. It was then he became concerned and went to alert the authorities. And from the start Dan Foley became the obvious suspect. He was in the dispute over the half an acre of land. He was due in court to fight the case of trespass, where Moss was looking for £50 in damages and all the locals were casting their fingers of suspicion in his direction. He had made the statement to some of the locals that there would only be one of them around for the court case. But was this enough to condemn him? It certainly appeared to be in the court of public opinion. Was it enough to cast him out of the local community and make him a pariah? But it wasn't just Dan that was suffering. His whole family were too. No one would even speak to them. They would not be served in the local shop. The local creamery refused to take Dan's milk. He could not even get any help on the farm. Everyone refused. In a time before you had machinery to do all the hard work for you, Farmers would help each other out with things like bringing in the hay, ploughing the fields and any jobs that included manual labour. And especially for a man like Dan who was 62, getting help with such tasks was important to keep the farm running. As time went on, this hate campaign against Dan Foley escalated to the point where one night as Dan and his family sat around the open fire in the kitchen, gunshots rang out shattering the glass in the kitchen window to the front of the house. They could not tell who fired the shots, but Dan maintained they had to have been discharged from a close range. He would later say that it was a murderous act. Who else but a person with murder in their hearts would do a thing like that? This episode left the family in complete shock. He said the shock nearly killed his brother Michael, who suffered from ill health anyway. He had been sitting directly in front of the window. How he hadn't been seriously injured or worse was a miracle. This event left Dan feeling very intimidated and worried for the safety of his family. When asked why he thought it had happened, his answer was, Sure, you know I'm being boycotted. Then on another occasion, an explosion rang out some 10 metres from Dan's house, across the road in a ditch. It blew a crater two feet deep and three feet wide in the ditch. Neighbours initially thinking it was a clap of thunder. The fuse wire was later discovered in a field next to the house. Things were getting out of hand and Dan and his family were terrified. But who was behind all this destruction and why take it to such a level? Was it the real culprit or culprits reinforcing to the locals that the finger of suspicion should continue to point in Dan's direction? keeping the spotlight away from themselves. What was the motive for these attacks? Was Dan Foley really the violent person he was being accused of being? Certainly in the right situation and when pushed to the limit, people can have the propensity for a violent outburst. But was that what really happened? Whatever the real story was, what was happening to Dan in the wake of the murder all began to tell on him. He started to visibly age He couldn't cope with the pressure of the boycott. Being accused of something he may have been innocent of was bad enough. But when they started attacking his family, it all just got too much for Dan. Island Crimes and Mysteries
The local parish priest, Father Michael O'Donoghue, about 10 days after the murder, in the very church Moss Moore's funeral had taken place in, spoke from the altar and pleaded with his parishioners that if they had any credible information to come forward and tell the Gardaí. Then, about a year after the murder, the then Bishop of Kerry, Dennis Moynihan, wrote a letter to the priests of the parish, which Father Michael read out to his parishioners. In the letter, the bishop threatened that if there was any crimes committed in regards to land or any disputes over land, the perpetrators of these crimes would have to go to the bishop to have their confession heard for what was known as a reserved sin. In other words, a reserved sin is a sin that cannot be absolved by an ordinary priest. Absolution for these sins can only be obtained from a bishop, or in some cases only the Pope himself. So for the local parishioners, this was a very serious threat indeed. But still, no one came forward with solid evidence despite the fear of God being put in them. But I'm guessing the locals were slow to argue over land after that threat from the bishop. Four years after the murder in 1963, Dan Foley collapsed in a field close to his house and died. The irony being, it was not too far from where Moss had been found. Another victim of the field, you could say. Dan had spent the remainder of his life proclaiming his innocence to anyone who would listen. The state solicitor at the time would not pursue an arrest, as he felt there was not enough evidence to convict him. The guard he thought different. In the end, no one was ever charged with Moss Moore's murder. Dan Foley's family to this day continue to vehemently support him. His nephew said the consequences of the murder are still present within the family to this day, many of them having left the area to get away from the whispers and suspicion that linger nearly 66 years on. He feels his uncle was wronged and he has spent his life defending him. He even bought back Dan Foley's land when it came up for sale. Moss's nephew, Michael Brosnan, said he couldn't be 100% sure, but does feel that the court case may have been the catalyst for the murder. The overriding sentiment to this day is that Dan Foley was the alleged murderer. But can we ever say this for certain? The case remains open. A cold case. But the chances of us ever knowing who really killed Moss Moore are getting slimmer with each passing year. In Rhea Moore and the wider Kerry area, the murder still remains in the psyche of people's minds. There are still people alive today that remember the murder clearly and the field brought the story to a younger generation and reignited an interest in it. John B. Keane was at pains to say that the Bull McCabe was only very loosely based on Dan Foley. But the similarities are hard to dismiss. And whether you like it or not, it's hard to distinguish Dan from the bull. Dan's nephew saying that this similarity also caused problems for the family. But John B.'s son, Billy, has reiterated the fact that his dad only loosely based the character on Dan. He said the bull was a combination of several characters known to his dad. Whatever the case, the question remains. Who killed Moss Moore? And why? What do you, the listeners, think after hearing the story of one of Ireland's longest ever cold cases? So guys, that's it for today's episode of the Ireland Crimes and Mysteries podcast. Again, thanks for your listenership and don't forget to subscribe to the show and hit that auto download so you never miss an episode. Until the next time, keep your eyes open and your mind curious. This podcast has been compiled from information gathered in the public sphere, like news articles, documentaries and open source material that can be found on the web. Everything in this podcast is alleged unless a conviction has taken place. You've been listening to Island Crimes and Mysteries with Nils. Join us for another episode coming real soon.